In this video, we will discuss products of vector spaces, and we will start a little introduction to quotients of vector spaces, which is the topic of our next video. For this video, this is our overview slide, which we'll spend about five minutes going over before we go back in the main part of our video and take each topic with more detail and with more examples. We start by defining the product of several vector spaces. So suppose we have vector spaces v1, v2 up to vm. These are vector spaces over some field. The product v1 cross v2 cross over to vm is defined by this m tuple, where we have a vector v1, a vector v2, up to a vector vm. The first vector v1 is an element of the first vector space. The second vector v2 is an element of the second vector space. The third vector, v3, is an element of the third vector space, all the way up to the last v, the mth vector, vm, is an element of the mth vector space. We could define addition on this cross product, or this product of vector space, as defined as, once we have our m tuple, u1, u2, up to um, and v1, v2, up to vm, we just add component by component, so u1 plus v1, u2 plus v2, up to um plus vm. It's totally analogous to vector addition, say, in Rn, except now you're not um, adding scalars or real numbers. You're adding vector component to vector component. Next, we define scalar multiplication on the product of vector spaces. So if you have a scalar a multiplied by our m tuple, then we just multiply each of the components of our m tuple by our scalar a. So we have a v1, a v2, all the way up to a v m. Then we have this theorem here. So it shouldn't surprise you, once we defined the product of vector spaces, and then we defined addition and scalar multiplication, the next thing we're going to say is the product of vector spaces is a vector space. So suppose v1, v2 up to vm are vector spaces over a vector field f, then the product v1 cross v2 up to vm is a vector space over f. And for our first example, we have elements of the cross product of the vector space p2, that is polynomials of degree 2 or less, crossed with r3. So the elements then are lists of length 2 with the first item being a polynomial of degree 2 or less, and the second item is going to be a vector in R3. So an example of something from this product of vector spaces is 5 minus 6x plus 4x squared and 3, 8, 7 because this first component is a polynomial of degree 2 le or less and this next component, 3, 8, 7, is a vector from R3. The dimension of a product is the sum of dimensions. So suppose v1, v2 up to vm are finite dimensional vector spaces, then v1 cross v2 cross up to vm is finite dimensional, and the dimension of the product of the vector space is equal dimension of vector space 1 plus dimension of vector space 2 up to dimension of vector space m. Next we are going to talk about a mapping from the products of vector spaces to direct sums. So the first thing we're going to do is review direct sums. We had talked about those in our video about vector spaces and subspaces. And to start review of direct sums, we're going to start with the definition of the sum of subsets. So suppose we have these subsets, u1, u2, um. We can define the sum of these subsets, u1 plus u2 up to um, as equal to then vector u1 plus vector u2 up to vector um, where the vector u sub i is an element of the subset u sub i. A sum of subsets now is a direct sum if each element of the sum of subsets can be written in only one way as the sum of vectors u1 plus u2 up to um. And we will do an example of both of these in the main part of our video. Here is the theorem that produces a map from the product of, of, of vector spaces to the direct sum. Suppose we have subspaces u1, u2 up to um. They're subspaces of v. We can define a linear map, then t, to go from the product of these subspaces to the sum of subspaces. And we define the linear map t on the vector u1, u2 up to um. Remember, this comes from the product space. 
and that will be equal to u1 plus u2 up to um, and this is coming from the sum. Then we also have this theorem that u1, u2 up to um, the sum is a direct sum if and only if this mapping t is injective. We also have this theorem, a sum is a direct sum if and only if the dimensions add up. That is, suppose V is finite dimensional and U1, U2 up to UM are subspaces of V, then the <clears throat> sum of subsets is a direct sum if and only if the dimension of the sum of subsets is equal dimension of U1 plus dimension of U2 up to dimension of UM. Our last topic will be a quick introduction to quotients of vector spaces. This is the main topic of our next video, but we'll introduce the ideas here. So we define a vector plus a subspace. So suppose V is a vector in the vector space V and U is a subspace of V. Then V plus U is the subset of V defined by the vector V plus U is equal to U, uh, V plus U where u is a vector in the subspace u. That wraps up our overview, so we're ready to take a closer look at each of our topics, and we'll start with products of vector spaces. The definition of a product of a set of vector spaces is, suppose we have vector spaces v1, v2 up to vm, and these are vector spaces over some field f, then the product v1 cross v2 cross up to vm is defined by the m-tuple of vectors where the first vector comes from the first vector space v1, the second vector v2 comes from the second vector space v2, and essentially the ith vector comes from the ith vector space, and finally we have v sub m coming from the mth vector space vm. If you've had set theory before, this is known as the cross product of a number of sets. Before we do some examples, I also want to define addition on the product of vector spaces as well as scalar multiplication on the product of vector spaces. So suppose we have this m tuple, u1, u2 up to um, so m vectors that come from the product of the vectors v1, v2 up to vm. We also have this m tuple of vectors, v1, v2, vm that comes from the cross product of u1, v2 up to vm. And we want to add these two m tuples together. We do this just as we would regular vectors. So we're going to add vector u1 to vector v2. We'll add u2 to v2, so component by component, u3 goes to u3. And finally, u sub m gets added to v sub m. So we still have an m tuple. And you can see um, each component is added component-wise. For scalar multiplication, let's say we have a vector v1, v2, vm, that's an m tuple that comes from the product of these vector spaces v1, v2 up to vm. When we multiply then this m tuple by a scalar, the scalar just multiplies each component. So we get av1, av2 up to avm. For my first example, I'm going to use v1 equals 1, 2, and v2 equals 3, 4, 5. The first thing to know is v1 and v2 are not vector spaces, right? They don't have the additive identity. They're not closed, right? If v1 were to be closed, then I'd have to be able to add 1 plus 2 and get 3, but 3 isn't in here. So these are not vector spaces. They are sets. And remember, vector spaces are sets as well, along with these two operations of addition and scalar multiplication, which satisfies a number of properties. But underneath, vector spaces are sets. And so in the same way that we can define the product of a vector space, we can define the product of sets. And I wanted to be able to have a small enough set, which is why I avoided a vector space, but a small set, to show you the entirety of a cross product. So again, uh, v1 and v2 are sets, and I'm showing the cross product of sets here. So to get the cross product of v1 and v2, first, the first thing to notice is they're going to be all ordered pairs. And it's pairs because there's only two, um, vector sp or ve two sets, v1 and v2. So the first element comes from v1, the second element comes from v2, so there's two elements, so it's an ordered pair, where again, the first element is from v1, the second element is from v2. 
all of them, all of the ordered pairs. So I have to figure out how to write all the pairs where the first element comes from v1, the second element comes from v2. So I'm going to start by taking my first element of v1 and combining it with every element of v2. So I'm going to have 1, 3, 1, 4, and then 1, 5. Next, I'm going to take my second element of v1 and combine it with everything in v2. So I have 2, 3, 2, 4, and 2, 5. So this is v1 cross v2. And just to repeat, the cross product is a set of all ordered pairs. So this word all is the reason why I went outside vector spaces, because I wanted a small set that was kind of interesting. All ordered pairs, where the first element is from the first set, and the second element is from the second set. For my second example, I'm going to give you a proper product of vector spaces. So we're going to look at what elements of this cross product of the polynomials of degree two or less with R3. And the elements then are going to be lists of length two with the first element as a polynomial of degree two or less, and the second as a vector from R3. So an example of an element from this cross product is the polynomial 5 minus 6 plus 4x squared paired with the R3 vector 3, 8, 7. Again, the first element is from P2, and the second element is from R3. And if we happen to have a second element from the cross product, so let's say P2 is 2 plus 2x squared, and our R3 vector is 0, 1, 3, we add component by component, so we're adding polynomials to polynomials. We get 7 minus 6x plus 6x squared, and then we're adding vectors to vectors, or R3 vectors to R3 vectors. So we get 3, 9, and 9. So this here is how the addition on our product of vector spaces work. You always are adding things in the same vector spaces together, right? So you don't confuse things and add polynomials to vectors in R3. It's always polynomials to polynomials, vectors to vectors. So each element is added element by element. As we had mentioned in our overview, now that we have the definition of the product of vector spaces and we have an addition defined and a scalar multiplication defined, we have this theorem that the product of vector spaces is itself a vector space. So suppose v1, v2 up to vm are vector spaces over some vector field f, then v1 cross v2 cross up to vm is a vector space over f. We're going to skip the proof here, but we're going to mention that the additive identity then of our product of vector spaces is the zero, where the zero in the jth slot is the additive identity of the jth vector space. So bringing back our last example, where we had the space of polynomials degree two or less crossed with R3, now our zero vector then is going to be the zero vector of P2. So the zero vector, the polynomial, zero, is just simply zero. The zero of R3 is the zero, zero, zero triplet. So this is going to be the zero of P2 cross R3. The second point is the additive inverse of some uh, m tuple of vectors in the cross product is the negative of each of the vectors. Using our same example of P2 cross R3, if we had the polynomial 5 minus 6x plus 4x squared and then the R3 vector as 3, 8, 7, then the additive inverse is the negative of the polynomial, which is 5 plus 6x minus 4x squared, and the negative inverse of our 3, 8, 7, which is just negative 3, negative 8, and negative 7. Our next example is a question. Is R2 cross R3 equal to R5? And then the next question is R2 cross R3 isomorphic to R5. The answer to the first question is R2 cross R3 is not equal to R5 because elements of R2 cross R3 look like an ordered pair matched with an ordered triplet, right? This first ordered pair is an element of R2. This triplet is an element of R3, whereas elements of R5 are a uh, fivelet, well, I don't know what they're called, a quintuplet, x1, x2, x3, x4, and x5, right? 
So this is what R5 looks like. So they are not equal. R2 cross R3 is isomorphic to R5. And to show two spaces are isomorphic, we need a mapping T, a linear map, that goes from R2 cross R3 to R5. And this mapping needs to be injective, or one-to-one -one is another way of saying injective, and it also needs to be surjective, or onto. To find my mapping, if I look at my elements of R2 cross R3, it looks like this ordered pair x1, x2, and then I have an R3, x3, x4, x5. If I want to map it to something in R5, which looks like x1, x2, x3, x4, x5, I can kind of just concatenate these two together. In other words, for your consideration, we will propose the linear map T from R2 cross R3 to R5, where T takes the x1, x2, x3, x4, x5 in R2 cross R3 and maps it to the vector in R5, x1, x2, x3, x4, x5. This one is fairly straightforward to show that t is linear. It's one-to-one -one and onto, so I will leave that to you, and therefore is an isomorphism. So there's an isomorphic map from R2 cross R3 to R5. Our next example is to find the basis of P2 cross R2. Personally, the first thing I would do is find the basis of P2, so that's 1x x squared, and then a basis for R2, which is 1, 0, 0, 1. And also, just to remind myself what these elements look like, I have a polynomial of degree 2 or less, so a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared, and then an element from R2, an x and a y. This x, by the way, is different from this x. This is variable x. This is um, a number x. And honestly, my first try would be to cross the bases for P2 with the bases for R2, and I get something that looks like this. Like, so I have 1, which each of these elements from R2, so I'm going to have 1 and 1, 0, and 1 and 0, 1. I'm going to take x and combine it with each element from R2, so I have x, 1, 0, x, 0, 1, and then I'm going to have x squared combined with 1, 0, and 0, 1. So this would be nice if this were the case, but it just doesn't work. So you cannot just use the cross product of the bases. And the reason why it doesn't work is, well, among other things, it doesn't span the case where you have some scalar x and then the 0, 0 vector, right? Over here, I can't really get the 0, 0 vector because remember, when we take these bases vectors and we want to make any vector, let's suppose we want to make x and 0, 0, from as a linear combination of our bases vectors, right? So our linear combination of our bases vector is going to look like C1 times this first bases vector, proposed bases vector, plus C2 times our second proposed bases vector, C3 times our, sec our third proposed vector, vector, all the way up to C6 times our sixth proposed bases vector. But the thing is, again, it doesn't span vectors such as 2, 0, 0 because these C2, the, what I want is C2, for example, maybe to be equal to 2, so I get my 2 here, but then it's going to multiply by my 1, 0 vector. In other words, I can't have something, I don't have anything here that somehow I'm going to get rid of the 1, 0, right? There's nothing I can multiply to get rid of the 1, 0 once I get the 2, over here in the x position or in the first coordinate position. And it's because I'm not multiplying this 1, 0 by its own scalar. I'm multiplying the scalars by these this entire basis vector. So I do need to do something else. But the good news is it's something that's kind of even easier than taking the cross product of the basis vector. Remember, that's that would be a wrong thing to do. This does not work. And the approach I'm going to take is first not worry about this R2 coordinate. I'm just gonna set my x, y equal to zero, zero. I'm just not gonna pay attention to it all. I want my bases so I can get any polynomial. I can get any polynomial of the form a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared. So I'm going to combine my bases vector one, x, and x squared with my zero, zero. Again, I'm ignoring this for now. I'm gonna add it on later. So now when I take linear combinations of this three sets of vectors, 
I'm going to take a, a constant, a naught, times my first basis, proposed basis vector, which is 1, 0, 0, plus another uh, constant, times my second basis vector, which is x, 0, 0, and then a third constant times my last basis, proposed basis vector, x squared, and 0, 0. When I multiply in my scalars, I just multiply my scalars by each component. So I'm going to have a naught times 1, which is a naught. My a naught times 0, 0, which, by the way, just goes to 0, 0. I have my a1x my a1 times 0, 0, my a2 x squared, and my a2 0, 0. Again, the a0 0, 0, the a1 0, 0, a2 0, 0, those are all 0, 0s. When I add, remember we defined our addition, we add component by component. So we're going to add our a0 plus a1x plus a2 x squared, and then I have 0, 0 plus 0, 0 plus 0, 0. So here I've spanned the first part um, of P2 of R. Now I need to figure out what to do so I can make these zero zeros become 1 and 0. But actually, I just need to add two more vectors to this, right? These three will span my polynomials. I need two vectors that'll let me, independent of the polynomials, just come up with an x and a y. So in other words, if I just add my 1, 0, and 0, 1, so I'm going to have my 1, 0, 0, my x, 0, 0, my x squared, 0, 0. Now I'm going to ignore my polynomial, and I'm going to put 0 and 1, 0, and 0 and 0, 1. This will span my P2 and uh, cross R2. I'm going to show you this on my next slide. But I need more space, so I deleted everything, but I did keep the uh, vectors that we are considering for our bases. Again, it was the 1, 0, 0, x, 0, 0, x squared, 0, 0. And then ignoring the polynomial, putting zeros for our polynomials, our bases for x, y, 1, 0, and 0, 1. Now I can add scalar multiples of each of our bases vectors. So a0 times our first bases vector, a1 times our second bases vector, a2 times our third bases vector. And now my scalar, instead of calling them a0, a1, a2, I'm going to call my next scalar x times my next basis vector 0, 1, 0, and then another scalar y times my next basis vector 0, 0, 1. And you know, if you wanted, you could put a3 and a4. That would have been fine too, but I just wanted to call them x, y, so it would look like this at the end. They're just scalars. They're just variables for scalars. When I multiply my scalars in, here I get a1 and 0, 0, a2x and 0, 0, a2x squared and 0, 0, here I get x times 0, so I have 0, and then here I'll have x 0, here I'll have y times 0, which is just 0, here I'll have y times the vector 0, 1, so I'm going to have 0, y. Now using my definition of addition on our cross product or our product of vector spaces, I can add all my polynomials together, so I get a1 plus a1x plus a2x squared plus 0 plus 0. So that's my a0 plus a1x plus a2x squared. And then for my r2 portion, I have 0, 0 plus 0, 0 plus 0, 0 plus x0 plus 0y. So that simply gives me xy. So now I've spanned the space of polynomials of degree 2 or less here and the space of r2, uh, two-dimensional vectors. And at this point, we've shown that these bases span the space Technically, we also need to verify they're linearly, ind linearly independent, but that's not terribly difficult, and therefore, the, the set of vectors is a basis. And just to remind you what we did is we essentially first established a basis for our first vector space, V1, and then we crossed it with the zero vector of V2, right? The zero vector of R2 is zero, zero, and we crossed that with the bases for v1, which is 1x, x squared. And then we concatenated that with then a basis for v2, which is 1, 0, and 0, 1, and crossed it with the 0 of v1. And the 0 of v1, the 0 polynomial, was just 0. So this here in blue is essentially the approach or the um, tactic, no, strategy, strategy you want to take when you're finding a basis for the product of vector spaces. This next theorem, I think we're going to state this without proof. Dimension of a product 
is the sum of dimensions. So suppose v1, v2, vm are finite dimensional vector spaces, then v1 cross v2 cross vm is finite dimensional. And the dimension of the product of the vector spaces is equal to the sum of the dimension of each vector space. The next topic we're going to cover, we're going to look at a mapping between the product of vector spaces and direct sums. To do that, we're going to go back and review what a direct sum is. In particular, we're going to start with the sum of subsets. The sum of subsets is a topic we had covered in a previous video when we talked about vector spaces and their subspaces. So if we have a bunch of subsets of a vector space V, and let's say our subspaces are called capital U1, capital U2, capital UM, we can define then the sum of these subsets, U1 plus U2 plus up to UM, to be the set of ordered pairs, that's all the ordered pairs, such that the first uh, element is a vector from the subset u1, the second element is a vector from u2, up to the nth element is a vector from um. So ui is an element of the set u sub i, and then you sum these elements together. And this is called a direct sum if each element of the sum of subset can be written in only one way as a sum u1 plus u2 to um. So let's do some examples. We're going to let u1 be the subspace of f3 such that the z coordinate or the third coordinate is equal to 0. So in other words, u1 looks like x, y, 0. And then u2 is going to be 0, 0, and then the third coordinate, the z coordinate, 0, 0, 3. u3 then is going to be equal to the set of coordinates where we have a 0 for the first coordinate and the second and third coordinate are equal. In other words, 0, y, y. And I believe this y here is different from this y. So the fact that they're called the same thing, don't let that fool you. So we're going to show that u1 plus u2 plus u3 is not a direct sum. First, we need to figure out our sum of subsets. So u1 plus u2 plus u3. So those are vectors of the form x1, y1, 0, that's from u1, plus vectors of the form 0, 0, z2, and that's from u2. And I put these subscripts so that we know which subset it comes from, so that I'm not confused over here and think that this y is equal to this y. So from u3, we have 0, y3, y3. So when we add this together, we have x1, 0, 0. So we have x1 as our first coordinate, our y1 plus y3 as our second coordinate, and z2 plus y3 as our third coordinate. In other words, this looks like a lot like r3, right, because we have some uh, scalar from our field, another scalar from our field, and then a third different scalar from our field. So in other words, it looks like x, y, z, you know, three different scalars, and that's equal to f3. So in some sense of the word, the u1, u2, u3, when you sum them together, you get back f3. So kind of like u1, u2, u3 makes these partitions of f3, or divides f3 into three different sets. But together, they all come back to form f3. Next comes the question of whether or not the sum, u1, u2, u3, is a direct sum. And actually, we have the answer. It's not a direct sum, so we need to figure out why. And what this says, this is a direct sum if each element of u1, u2, um can be written in only one way. So in other words, you know, the, the one that's easiest to do is the identity. So I can make the identity element 0, 0, 0 by adding uh, u1 equal to 0, 0, 0, u2 equal to 0, 0, 0, and u3 equal to 0, 0, 0. I mean, this is always the case. You can always do the um, identity elements as long as they are, um, something here doesn't preclude a zero as being one of the elements. But nothing says that y cannot be zero. Nothing here says that this x cannot be zero or this z cannot be zero. So I can take the identity element from u1, u2, u3, add them together, and I get the zero, zero, zero from f3. But what I can also do is I can take u1 to equal to 0, 1, 0, u2 equal to 0, 0, 1, and u3 equal to 0, negative 1, negative 1, right? They all follow the pattern over here. I have x equal to 0, y equals to 1, 
and then my last element is 0. So this is from U1. U2, I have a 0, 0, and then a Z value, which is here. And U3, I just need my last two coordinates equal, which I have, negative 1, negative 1. But when I add these three vectors together, U1, U2, U3, you see I get the 0 vector, 0, 0, 0. And therefore, this sum of subsets is not a direct sum because I can get 0 two different ways. Next, I have a theorem that produces a mapping from the products of vector space to the direct sum. And then I have this other theorem here. So I'm going to clear some things out, put this on the top so we can talk about it just a little bit more. For your reference, I have our definition of product of vector spaces here, the definition of sum of subsets here, and the theorem that I wanted to just show you what this mapping looks like over here. And I'm going to use our last example where we had u1 is equal to the subset of f3, x, y, 0, u2 is a subset of f3, 0, 0, z, and u3 was a subset of f3, 0, 0, 0, y, y. And I want to show you this mapping t to go from u1 cross u2 cross u3 to u1 plus u2 plus u3. So here I have the fact that we want to look at this mapping from u1 cross u2 to u3 to u1 plus u2 plus u3. And what helps me a lot is to understand what each of these spaces, this product space and the sum of subset spaces looks like. So first I'm going to remind myself what u1 cross u2 cross u3 looks like. So it's going to be a triplet where the first element comes from u1, so it looks like x1, y1, 0. The second element comes from u2, 0, 0, z2. And the third element comes from u3, 0, y3, y3. And remember, I like to put the 1 subscript on things from u1, the 2 subscript on things from u2, and the 3 subscript on things from u3, because I want to make sure that I don't confuse this y as being the same element of this y. This is how your book writes it which is why I kept it in this form, but I kind of like to translate it to this. Well, next I want to see what u1 plus u2 plus u3 looks like. And that was our previous example. We take u1, which is of the form x1, y1, 0, plus 0, 0, x, uh, z2, plus 0, y3, y3. So it looks like x plus 0 plus 0, which is x1. Our y1 plus 0 plus y3 is our second coordinate and then our 0 plus z2 plus y3 is our third coordinate. And in our last example, we noted that these are just three different scalars, so they're elements of f3, but this is not something we're going to use in this example. The mapping that we are given, there's probably more than one map, but the obvious map to go from the cross to the sum is then to take something from the cross product and then to sum them together. In other words, when we take t of something from the cross product that looks like this, our x1, y1, 0 as our first coordinate, 0, 0, z2 from our second coordinate, this should be a 2, not a 3, and then 0, y3, y3 as our third coordinate, we can now, for our transform, sum them together. So I'm going to have my x1, y1, 0, plus 0, 0, z2, there should be a z2, plus 0, y3, y3. So our transformation takes this triplet from the cross product and gives us this triplet here from the sum. And I moved this line up just so I could do a quick example. So t of this triplet here comes from the cross product 2, 3, 0, 0, 0, 4, and 0, 1, 1. We, you know, they have this form, this first element's from u1, the second element's from u2, the third element is from u3. When I transform it to the sum u1, u2, plus u3, that's going to be 2, 3, 0, plus 0, 0, 4, plus 0, 1, 1, which gives us 2 plus 0 plus 0 is 2, 3 plus 0 plus 1 is 4, and 0 plus 4 plus 1 is 5. So this is how we transform this triplet to our vector in F3. Remember, we had noted that um, 
the sum looks like F3. And there are two other theorems that are related that I should mention. First, the sum of subsets U1 plus U2 plus UM is a direct sum if and only if this map T that we were given here when we related the product to the sum is injective. And the second theorem, a sum is a direct sum if and only if the dimensions add up. So suppose V is a finite dimensional vector space and U1, U2 up to UM are subspaces of V, then the sum of the subsets is a direct sum if and only if dimension of the direct sum is equal to the sum of dimension U1, dimension U2 up to dimension UM. So these two theorems are useful if you have to prove things about the direct sum. For our final topic, we're going to introduce the topic of our next video, quotients of vector spaces. We're just going to cover this one definition here. So if, suppose we have a vector v and a vector space v, and u, a subspace of that same vector space v. Then we're going to define the vector plus the subspace. It's a subset of v, and it's defined as v plus u for all vectors u in the subspace u. So let's take a look at that. I have the definition here for your reference, and I'm going to do this example to illustrate this definition of a vector v plus a subspace u. We're going to let u then be the subspace, the set of points x, comma 2x, and r2. And we're going to let our vector v be the vector 1720. The first thing we want to know about this subspace U is it's actually a line. And the way we can look at this is our Y value is equal to twice X. In other words, it's the line Y equals 2X. And we get that straight from here, right? Our value for Y is equal to literally 2X. Or I can also do this just by plotting points. So U are points of the form X, 2X. So I have 0, 0. I have 1, 2. I could keep going 2, 4, right? Negative negative 1, negative 2. Then when I add v plus u, I can just add my vector 1720 to my x plus 2x. So 1720 to 0, 0 gives me 1720. 1720 plus 1, 2 gives me 1822. And now I can plot that. Over here, I have my points 0, 0, 1, 2. If I had plugged in 2 for x, I would have gotten 2, 4. So you can see it's exactly this line, y equals 2x. So u is my line, y equals 2x. And then I can add to each point 1720. So to 0, 0, I can add the point 1720. To this point 1, 2, I can add 1720 to get the point 1822. And here I've connected the points for u. So again, u goes from 0, 0 to 1, 2, and it's a line. And, it, and we can we find this line is y equals 2x. Now I can connect these points. So I've drawn my line through my points. And remember how we got these points is this first point, 70, 1720. It's because we added to our u, 0, 0, we added the vector 1720. So this point, 0, 0, which I know this doesn't go directly to 0, 0, but it's supposed to. It's because I'm not good at drawing. But this line get shifted, or this point, I'm sorry, 0, 0, get shifted over to 1720. This point, 1, 2, get shifted over to 1822. This is 1, 2, it gets shifted over to 1822. So what ends up happening is our vector v shifts all of u over by v. It goes up 17 over, right? No, over 17, up 20. But the important thing to notice is this u, every point of u is shifted by the same amount, v. Let's take a look at u being a three-dimensional space. So let's say u is um, the points x, y, 0, and r3. In other words, the x, y plane, where z is equal to 0. So this is our u. Now we're going to consider u plus a vector v. And what happens is every vector in u, then, is shifted over by this vector v. It shifted over a little bit, looks like a little bit to the um, right, and a little bit up. Every point is shifted by the same exact v. 
if the V were just something with only um, a Y component and X is equal to zero, let's say the Y component was equal to, let's say V is equal to zero for X and two for Y, what that would mean is U plus V, our vector V will shift up our plane, the XY plane um, at the origin, up two units. So it'll be the same plane, parallel, but up two units. And that's all we're going to cover today from the quotients of vector spaces, but we'll cover that whole topic in our next video. So to review what we discussed in this video, we covered the products of vector spaces. The first thing we did is we defined the product of a number of vector spaces. So suppose we have v1, v2, vm. They're all vector spaces over a vector field f. Then the product v1 cross v2 cross up to vm is defined by the m tuple of vectors where the first or the ith vector comes from the ith vector space. We defined addition and we defined scalar multiplication. And once we defined addition and scalar multiplication, we have this theorem that the product of vector spaces is itself a vector space. And we have this example of the polynomial space of degree two or less crossed with R3. So an example of something in the space, in the cross of these two vector spaces, would be a polynomial 5 minus 6x plus 4x squared paired with the R3 vector 3h7. We have this theorem that the dimension of a product is the sum of the dimensions. So the dimension of this product of vector spaces is the sum of the dimension of the separate vector spaces. The next topic we covered was to relate products of vector spaces with direct sums. And to start, we talked about the sum of subsets. So if we have sets u1, u2, up to um, we can talk about the sum of these subsets as being the set of the sum of vectors u1, u2, up to um, where the uths of i, the ith vector of u, comes from the ith subset of capital U. And we said a direct sum is one where each element of the sum of subsets can be written in only one way as the sum of vectors u1, u2, up to um. We then had this theorem which related the products of vector spaces with direct sums. So suppose we have a subspaces u1, u2, up to um of a vector space v. We can then define a linear map T to go from the product of u1 cross u2 up to um to the sum of u1 plus u2 plus um. And we define that mapping as T of some element of the product space equal to, we take each element of the product space and sum them up. We have this theorem here that says then u1 or the sum u1, u2 up to um is a direct sum if and only if t is injective. So this, um, this mapping here is injective. We had the theorem that a sum is a direct sum if and only if the dimensions add up. So suppose v is finite dimensional and u1, u2 up to um are subspaces of v, then the sum u1, u2 up to um is a direct sum if and only if dimension of u, the sum of subsets is equal to the sum of the dimension of u1, u2, um. And finally, we introduced one definition from our topic of quotients of vector spaces, which is the topic of our next video. We talked about adding a vector to a subspace u. So suppose v is a vector in the vector space v, and u is a subspace of that same space v. Then v plus u is the subset of v defined by v plus u where u are all the vectors in our subspace u. And that's it for this video. Thank you for watching.